uh, a pleasure and an honor to share this stage with so many awesome presenters today. Uh, I, I just am still a little, uh, just, I don't know, I'm having such a good time. Uh, feeling really good. How are y'all feeling? Good? Yeah? Like at the home stretch here. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about microservices, but this is hopefully going to be a little different from uh, this talk in other settings. I've given this talk maybe a dozen times in the last year, uh, mostly to more technical, hands-on developer audiences. And I know a lot of you have technical backgrounds, but maybe you're more in management now like, uh, like I have been. Uh, and so um, in this talk, we'll focus on more of the management takeaways of building microservices uh, and how we incrementally build products, uh, especially at startups and ed tech, because that's kind of the world I know. Uh, as Mary said, I'm the CTO at a company called The Grade Network. Uh, I'll talk about what we do in a second, because that's going to be one of the stories. Um, but first, before we get into the real meat of this talk, let's just quickly define microservices, because it's kind of the obligatory thing to do. Um, how many of you are using microservices or think you might be? It's OK if you're not 100% sure, because I I this term's been around a long time. But yet, for some reason, there's still everyone has a def different definition. Uh, and there's um, some really smart people who've come up with some really good definitions. I love Martin Fowler's stuff. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with him. Um, and he's got a good uh, article he wrote with James Lewis uh, a few years ago um, about microservices and how he defines microservices. Uh, and uh, you can go read it. I'm not going to read his quote. Uh, here's what I'm going to say about microservices for the purpose of this talk. So just to frame your mind uh, into what we're going to be um, getting into today. Uh, I call anything a microservice if it's got encapsulated functionality, independently deployable out to its own server or somewhere that it lives out in the internet in a distributed system. And in my case, I used HTTP interfaces for all the microservices we're going to talk about today. I know that that's not the only way to do it, though. So uh, you may do it your own different variation, and that's fine. But I also think it's important to talk about why we build things in microservices. Um, has anyone had a horror story about microservices or just feel bad about doing it? Yeah, there's definitely a number of hands. Uh, so I think the most common talk I see at conferences lately is this is how microservices killed our company or blew up our dev team or something terrible sunk our ships. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, they are way more complex in a lot of cases than building monoliths or just building single systems that deploy to single servers and you have replication. Um, and so uh, there's often the question of like, why do you build things this way? Uh, and we'll see through these stories a little bit about how we took advantage of some of the sort of positive pros of um, microservices. But uh, the things I always point people to are, one, you get really strict separation of concerns. Uh, you can't have a junior developer come in there and build a SQL query that joins things across microservices, because it's just not possible. So it sometimes can prevent a lot of problems there. Uh, it's way better when you get to a point where you need to scale. Now, some companies don't have to deal with that. Some products don't have to deal with that. So you have to know your own domain, what you're doing. Uh, and then finally, the swappability and flexibility is really awesome. Uh, and that will become, I think, a, maybe a bigger takeaway from this talk, hopefully. So that's why you might choose to use microservices. Uh, a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago now, I joined a company called Packback as the first software engineer. Uh, initially, I worked with an offshore team in um, India and then eventually hired on and led the engineering team there. It was my first time kind of transitioning from individual contributor to team lead. Um, and we started off as a textbook rental company. Essentially, what we did was we uh, would go to the publishers, we'd get rights to distribute a book, and we would distribute that book for $5 every day that a student actually used the book instead of making the college student pay 300 bucks when they wanted to buy that book up front. So it's a super cool model. I, I still, uh, Packback has since pivoted, spoiler alert, because that's what this talks about. Uh, but um, it, it is still super cool. I wish, I hope that somebody gets out there and does this. We were on Shark Tank, Mark Cuban puts $500,000 into us, and that was kind of our first little seed money, and it was a really exciting time. Uh, we built an engineering team, we built out a product, you used microservices, a lot of best practices, it was really fun uh, building this thing. Um, and we had ourselves, this is kind of like an abbreviated sort of map of what we were building. Um, we were able to have users check out, rent their books, view them on our platform, um, handled a you know, handful of other customer service functions. Uh, the challenge we had was barely anybody could actually rent any textbooks because publishers weren't willing to work with us. So like any two-sided marketplace, we had the challenge of we can fill up one side of the marketplace, but we can't fill up the other. 
uh, until we have that side. And so you're sort of like stuck, like do we get college students and not have anything to give them, or do we find publishers and not have any customers who actually want to buy books for them? Um, so a lot of times what startups will do when they're faced with this chicken and egg or two-sided marketplace problem is we will build some kind of side project or some kind of marketing project that will bring users into the site. So that's exactly what we did at Packback. Uh, it basically started off that the idea was if we can build a question and answer platform that college students can use in their class, so the professor would kind of oversee this question and answer platform, college students can use it, they'll be interacting with it all the time, we'll catch them at just the right moment and we'll sell them textbooks. And publishers will love this because we're going to have this access to students all the time. It's going to be great. Uh, and we put together a little product that did just that. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a huge engineering team, and so one of the founders got together with a couple interns, and he threw together, this was our first version of the Packback Questions product. It used an off-the-shelf product called AnswerBase as the back end and storage and basically the main bulk of the product here. Uh, we'd store up the student data, and um, we would sort of give access rights to professors for the like, counts of who asked how many questions and who answered how many questions in Google Drive and Google Sheets. And then we used MailChimp to market to the students every week and tell them, hey, remember to come back to pack back questions and ask questions. And then we'd try to sell them textbooks and things like that. Uh, it, was, it actually worked pretty well. We got really good feedback from professors. They loved the fact that they could keep an eye on how their students were doing in the class, uh, but they didn't have to have these like, open discussion days where they lost a whole lecture period. They could have it happen offline, or online rather, but outside of the class. And students loved it because the really ambitious ones would show off how much they knew by asking really smart questions or answering them. Uh, and the ones who needed more help could find the best students in class to get help from. The challenge was, the whole point of this was to direct students to actually want to go rent our textbooks, and very few of them converted to do that. So um, you know, this is one of those things that, as a startup, you're constantly doing. You're basically hypothesizing and then pivoting, and hypothesizing and pivoting. So we pivoted a bit. We said, what if we actually just made this our product? Now, we've still got a full-on engineering team who's building this books platform. We're supporting our users there, and uh, we're dealing with customer service and all those kind of issues that come up. So we didn't want to put a ton of effort into this question and answer platform until we really knew it was what we were doing and where we were pivoting to. So what we did was we set up Wufu, which is a, basically just a like Google Forms that also allows you to have payments in it. Uh, we use Zapier as kind of a message bus. How many of you have used Zapier? I'm like a huge advocate for Zapier, and they don't, they don't pay me, but it's awesome. Uh, basically, it'll connect APIs together and do the work that we as developers are often doing, especially when it comes to, like, let's say somebody likes your post, post on Facebook, you want to automatically send an email to your marketing team, you can do stuff like that on Zapier. Or for our case, when somebody would check out, a student would uh, check out, buy access to our platform, we would automatically add them to a list in MailChimp, we'd add them to Google Drive, and then we had a little bit of code that we wrote with an import script that pulled them into AnswerBase to actually uh, let them have access to the platform. So I know you guys are like, wait, what's going on? This isn't a talk about tech, and the engineers have built one little tiny import script, and that's all you did. Uh, that's exactly right, and that's intentional. Um, so something that was really important for us at Packback was we had spent a lot of time and money figuring out how to build this textbook rental platform, which was cool, but had no customers. We were not going to make the same mistake twice. So we said, let's spend all our time and money figuring out how to get the product right before we put the engineering effort into it. We did have some problems with this platform as it scaled up to thousands of students, though. Uh, big one was we had an intern whose full-time job every week was to go through and count the numbers of questions and answers asked on the platform. And then they would enter them into an Excel sheet and give them off to each professor. So that works when you had 100 students. It didn't work when you had 5,000 students. Uh, so we started to take more engineering resources into this project. And little by little, we rewrote pieces of this sort of I'll call it third-party microservice-based platform we had strung together. The first thing to uh, get done here was a report generator. Automatically, every week, it would spit together a report for each class, send it off to a professor. We built a custom checkout front end that would allow us to price things dynamically and test out discount rates for buying textbooks along with access to Packback questions. 
We built a custom checkout API that kind of did a little more extra work that Zapier wasn't quite capable of doing back then, uh, although Zapier's gotten better and it can now run custom code for you. And uh, we started to see this thing actually make a big impact. And we, we kind of realized around this point, and this is winter of 2015, um, so January or maybe just before, uh, we realized that this is going to become a big part of what Packback does. Uh, so at this point, we started to look at what it'll take to get this rebuilt into our own custom software. So at some point, we had a limit of some of these third-party services. AnswerBase wasn't built to do everything we wanted it to do. Uh, there were problems sending out reports because you could kind of only do them one way when you had one simple little script to do it. Uh, we also weren't sort of storing up and keeping, like, uh, I guess we weren't, we weren't handling all the data in the best way we could. And so we realized we have to rebuild this thing in our own platform. And what was really helpful is uh, because we had already built microservices around our whole books product, we were able to take some of that functionality, things like the login, checkouts, payments, and reuse it for our questions uh, platform that we built. So there's a lot of stuff that was already for, there for us. We just added a couple more APIs, a questions and an answer API, uh, and uh, put that together. And we had this done in about nine or 10 months, which is pretty quick for a, a full rebuild like this. So some things I learned along this sort of path at Packback. First of all, I love using third-party services uh, for things that you need to just test and figure out what's going to work before you actually build a real product. I think all too often in engineering, we get caught up in building really cool stuff and not building the right stuff. And our job is ultimately to build the right stuff for the companies we work for. And so if that means you can put together third-party services to get you there until you really figure out what it is you're building, I think that's what we should be doing more of. The other thing uh, that I started to ran into there was as we chose these third-party products, we didn't really know exactly how they would scale up. And that's something we all are going to have to face. And we had to be ready for the fact that we may not be able to grow as quickly as we want because we chose this route of sort of testing on lean MVPs rather than building a highly polished product. But you have to weigh those pros and cons. And then the other thing that was really interesting was that our engineering team was felt a bit threatened by this. Um, one of the things that's uh, scary to engineers who make their living writing code is that uh, you know, these third-party services are basically taking a lot of responsibilities that used to be only for engineers to do, uh, and they're sort of offloading them to services that we can pay a few hundred dollars a month for. So uh, that was a, a problem that I didn't anticipate, but we had to work through as a team and as a company. Finally, rewrites are hard. And I think this has been said at this conference already. Uh, I think it gets said a lot in the lead dev circles. But uh, it's much easier to do a rewrite if you have to when you have a complete template sitting there working for you and running with real customers than it is to do it uh, from scratch. And so it was better that we had something running. Uh, but if I could have this one back, I'm not sure that I would do a complete rewrite. I may refactor those services out one by one a little better. So that's learning. That's just what happens here. Um, when I joined the Grade Network, uh, I'll talk, I guess, like back up a second. What we do at the Grade Network is we hook K through 12 teachers up with college students who are studying to be teachers who grade papers for them. So if you're a ninth grade English teacher and you want to assign more essays because it's going to help your students score better in school, uh, the challenge is that you then have to grade more essays. So that means more nights and weekends you're going to spend grading papers. Uh, and for some teachers, there's a point of diminishing returns there where they kind of know how their students are doing. They just need to get them more feedback quicker. And that's where we come in at the grade network. Um, when I joined the grade network, um, we uh, were basically in the state that a lot of early MVPs are. We had a big monolith built by an offshore team. It was really a uh, low cost uh, platform that they put together, a low cost um, uh, code base they'd put together. There was one commit from the prior year. So I'm not sure what that means about how they were using Git, but I don't think it was correct. Um, the whole environment was hard-coded. I, I mean, it, how many of you have seen like a monolithic mess like this? And the, monoliths aren't bad in their own right, but like, the, yeah, environment stuff, hard-coded. You had to SSH in and pull to like get any code there, but they weren't even doing that. They had a whole duplicate sandbox folder in their code base where they would make live changes and then drag and drop them into production. It was just, uh, I mean, it was a mess, right? Um, and they came in to me and said, like, Carl, we just need a more reliable system. And when I saw this, I was like, well, there's a lot we can do to help with that. Um, 
So this was, uh, to me, this was a fun kind of project because uh, the challenge we had was we were super resource constrained, uh, and we had to get this thing ready between like summer of, of 2016 when I joined and fall 2016 when sort of the next batch of teachers would come in. One thing about ed tech that's kind of fun but challenging is that you have these set deadlines where your sort of rollover between semesters is going to happen, and you have to do a lot of product stuff between those. Any of you all work in ed tech? Am I the only one? Yeah, we got a couple. All right, yeah. So this is kind of a, a fun and interesting challenge. You always have these weird arbitrary deadlines set by schools. Uh, the first thing, uh, fixed version control. Um, this is an easy win. Uh, automating deployments is another big one. Uh, when you've got a legacy app like this that you're not fully sure how it works, but you're going to be slowly refactoring it, I think the biggest win you can have is the ability to fix it quickly because you're going to break it. And you have to be OK with breaking it, uh, but you have to know that you can get stuff out there to sort of get it cleaned up as soon as possible. And then we started testing the outer edges of this. Uh, how many of you have used like a Selenium or some kind of end-to-end -end testing framework like that? Yeah. So that's really helpful when you've got a legacy app like this that you don't, you, it's not set up to write unit tests. And that's one of the challenges about things uh, done like this, there's no dependency injection, there's no good way to mock things. And so unit tests are basically impossible until you really get in there. But if you have some layer of outer edge tests that you can sort of rely on, you know that you're at least not going to take the whole system down when you deploy, or at least if you do, you'll hear about it from your test suite uh, before you actually put it to production. And then the other thing that we did quickly was pull out the, uh, all the marketing pages and the blog and everything else that was, at that point, internally built in the system and put them into Squarespace. I can't tell you how much time I spent early on in my dev career at startups updating copy on websites because uh, startups change their copy all the time because we don't know who our customers are or how we're going to sell what we're selling to them. And so we constantly want to like, change that wording. And if we built that hard code in the platform like we had at the Grade Network before, uh, then that means some developers got to come in and change that, that wording all the time. So pulling that stuff out into Squarespace was huge. The challenge we had was there were a lot of problems in the data model uh, that were just not really, the, the problems with the assignment posting process due to a bad data model and bad data decisions early on. So rather than say, let's just sort of throw the whole thing out, and rebuild the whole thing from scratch. Because I think that would have been really, that was really tempting for me, uh, but also was tempting for everyone on the team. Uh, we decided let's just instead start pulling logic out of this big legacy gnarly application and into microservices. So this is a little more conventional of a pathway to getting to microservices. And I think I hear a lot of enterprise talks on things like this. We started with a big monolith and we slowly pulled out uh, functionality one microservice at a time. And so I was pretty familiar with the idea. We started with the courses and assignments API. Each just get their own database. They get pulled onto their own servers. We've got some packages to help share code between those APIs so that we're not rewriting everything from scratch. Um, and we started to establish a pace of what we could get done with this big, messy code base. Next, we want users to be able to message each other. So we started building out a user's API, which would handle messages, logins, basic things like that. Started putting more and more business logic in those APIs. Uh, because one thing that is really hard to define early on when you're trying to rewrite a project is what is the business logic we need to keep versus what is a mess or not actually applicable anymore. So as we're learning about that, we're pulling that back into the APIs. Uh, we're putting things like email notifications back into those APIs instead of in the legacy application. And as we do this, we come into one of the biggest problems in microservices, I think, which is how do we get access to our data now? How many of you have come up with a solution for that in microservices where you've got your data in like five, six different databases and somebody wants to report with all of it? Anybody have a good solution? <laughs> no, okay. Um, I'm still looking, but what we do, what we did, the Gray Network and Packback both, was we built a transporter API. And its job is basically go to those individual microservices, collect the data you need, munge it together, and send out reports to whoever requested it. So rather than building a bunch of complicated admin panels early on before we really knew what we were building, we instead were pulling together these reports whenever somebody clicked a button in the back end. So it was a really simple way to generate basic admin stuff without completely rebuilding. At the same time, we realize that the front end side of this is going to have to start to go as well. So we're pulling in, every time we get a new project that has new front end functionality, we start putting it into an Angular application. We load up the single page application within the legacy app. And as we've sort of like continued to grow and build this thing, we've basically turned the legacy application into a giant proxy. 
And this is where we're at today. So we have uh, our legacy app is kind of still like a gateway where all the flows go through. There's still a lot of functionality that's stuck in that legacy app. It's going to take us years probably to get completely off of it. And we're pulling in from all these third, uh, APIs we've got built in-house, as well as some third-party services. And we're able to now have third parties access our API, because we have a gateway that's got uh, login uh, permissions and that kind of access layer. And then we've got a single page app that's much cleaner for the front end. So some things to sort of take away from this. Uh, one is that if you're going to do a rebuild or a rewrite, you've got to start with tests and automation, because those are going to save your, your tail when you get out there and have to start making changes in the real world. Next, and this is maybe the, the hardest thing to change, especially the bigger an organization is. Uh, being small at the Great Network, this was not as hard. But rather than coming into, uh, coming into the organization and saying, we're just going like, to tear everything out, we had to get everyone on the team OK with being, um, being in a culture of improvement. And instead of saying that, you know, that's good enough, we're just going to ship it, we had to start saying, how can we do this a little better? And a little better than we did before. So we followed the Boy Scout rule. Don't leave anything worse than when you came in and found it. Uh, and then lastly, and you know, I can't stress this enough, so I'll say it again, refactoring is always a lot cleaner, a lot safer, and better than rewriting. So that's my talk. You can get these slides at pcto.co slash lead, and you can get me on Twitter at Carl L. Hughes. Thank you so much. Thank you.